If you could open to Isaiah chapter 2, as we look to God's Word, our passage for today is Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. This is the Word of God. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Father, speak to us through your word. Write it on our hearts. Do the work in us that only you can do. We need to hear from you, and we need you to work in us and through us for your glory in all things, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Some of the best stories involve a very sudden and dramatic turn into the unexpected. And the good stories, usually toward the end of those stories, there will be a sudden and unexpected turn for the good. For example, at the end of the original Star Wars trilogy, the good one, we see a very unexpected and sudden turn of events for the good, just when it looks like Luke Skywalker has been defeated and Emperor Palpatine is going to kill him and crush the rebellion, Darth Vader steps up to save his son. He grabs the force lightning projecting Palpatine and drops him over the edge, even as that lightning shoots through Vader's life support suit and shorts it out. And then Lando in the Millennium Falcon, and Wedge Antilles hit the main reactor of the second Death Star, and Luke escapes with his father's body just before the spectacular explosion. This this sudden turn of Darth Vader from darkness to light was even more shocking than than Palpatine's force lightning. Okay, that's a bad pun. At least it was to me when I was nine years old. I remember like, what? Darth Vader's a good guy now? And, you know... Many great stories, though, conclude with this unexpected turn from disaster to salvation. Frodo is going to walk away from the fires of Mount Doom in Return of the King. He's, not, he's made the decision he's not going to destroy the One Ring. He's going to keep it for himself. So he slips it on, and he starts to walk away, and Sam is just stunned and shocked that they have come all this way, and Frodo has decided not to go through with the mission. And then all of a sudden, it's Gollum, of all people, who come in, he, and he bites the ring off of Frodo's finger so that he can get it for himself. And in the, in the course of those events, both he and the ring fall into the fires of Mount Doom and are destroyed. J.R.R. Tolkien called these unexpected turns in the story the you catastrophe or the good catastrophe. It's the surprise ending that makes everything sad come untrue. And he believed that all of these man-made catastrophes were faint echoes of the great catastrophe, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's why we're here. We're here on this Sunday morning worshiping together because when hope seemed lost, When the long-awaited Messiah, the expectation of Israel for centuries, had been nailed to a Roman cross and killed in humiliating suffering, the greatest act of evil in the history of the world suddenly 
quite unexpectedly to the disciples and everyone else, Jesus rose from the dead and overthrew death and hell forever. Now, with all of these new catastrophes, you can kind of look back, once it happens, you can kind of look back in the story and see that it was actually being set up throughout the story. There were hints and there were echoes that were preparing for it. And that's what it is with the great new catastrophe. It was set up. It was foretold, but it still caught everyone by surprise. Today's passage in Isaiah, as we turn from chapter 1 to chapter 2, takes a very sudden and unexpected turn from tragic judgment to a happy ending. Isaiah 1 had ended with a prediction of eternal judgment for the, for the enemies of God. You shall be, talking to the people of God who are in rebellion, you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers and like a garden without water, and the strong shall become tender and his work a spark, and both of them shall burn together with none to quench them. And we talked about that last week, the picture of eternal fire in the condemnation of hell. That's how chapter 1 ends. But then chapter 2, we see this city, this temple, this mountain, Zion, Jerusalem, the temple of the Lord, exalted, established. And instead of the people of God being unfaithful to God with the nations of the earth, the people of God are now a faithful light to those nations, and the nations are streaming in to the mountain of God, to the temple of God, to hear from God. But even in chapter 1, there had been hints that God was going to do something great for his people. Even as he was laying out these stunning charges against his people, your hands are full of blood, everyone loves a bribe. Even as he was calling his people Sodom and Gomorrah and a whore, he was telling them that they could be forgiven. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And Zion shall be redeemed by justice. But still, the overall picture of the holy city that we see in Isaiah 1 is pretty dark and seemingly largely doomed. And yet in chapter 2, it's suddenly exalted. Why this sudden and shocking turn from such strong language of guilt, pollution, and coming judgment to such gloriously exalted language for the future of Zion? Well, I'd like to suggest that there's both a literary purpose within Isaiah for this turn and then there is a theological purpose, and actually those are not two different purposes, but they're the same. So I want us to look at this text carefully. So if you have Isaiah out, I want you to follow with me as I give you sort of an overview of where, we're, where we are and where we're going. Isaiah chapter, chapters 1 through 5 are the first part of Isaiah. They're, they're the introduction to the book. And then chapter 6 has Isaiah's call, where he sees a vision of the Lord in the temple and he's actually called to be a prophet. That's where his ministry really begins. Who will go for us? Here I am, send me. That's chapter 6. And these first five chapters, I don't think they represent prophetic ministry that Isaiah had before he was called. You don't have prophetic ministry before you're called. I think what they are is they're an introduction to the whole book that sets up the major themes of the book. Now, chapter one is the preface. It's the introduction to the introduction. And it covers all of the major themes of this book. And we've summarized that in our title for this sermon series, which is How the Holy One of Israel Saves Rebellious Sinners. That's, that's the focus of Isaiah. How the Holy One of Israel Saves Rebellious Sinners. In chapter one, we see rebellious sinners who deserve judgment, who have God's anger against them, but we also see a promise that they will be forgiven, cleansed, redeemed. Chapters 2 to 4 represent a second prophetic oracle that serves as sort of the body of the introduction of the book. If you look at it, it starts at the beginning of chapter 2, and it goes to the end of chapter 4. It's one oracle. We know it's a new oracle because it's introduced in chapter 2, verse 1, with the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So that's telling us this is another oracle. 
This oracle begins in chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, with what we just read, the exaltation of the mountain of the Lord of Zion. It ends in chapter 4 with the exaltation of the branch of the Lord. Look at chapter 4, verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. So we have the exaltation of the mountain of the Lord, the mountain of the temple of the Lord, and then the exaltation of the branch of the Lord as the two bookends of this introductory oracle. And in between, you have words of judgment against God's stubborn, sinful people. So if you look at the whole of chapters 1 to 4, what you will see is against a dark backdrop of the sinful rebellion of God's people and God's anger against their sin, there shines three precious promises. Chapter 1, verse 18 Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. That's a a promise of cleansing. And then the second promise in chapter 1, verse 27, Zion shall be redeemed by justice, and those in her who repent by righteousness. That's a promise of redemption. And now in the passage we just read today, a promise of exaltation, of glorification. How is all this possible? That a stubbornly rebellious people who are called Sodom and Gomorrah and are guilty of spiritual adultery and even spiritual prostitution, how they have blood on their hands, how they deserve God's judgment, how can they be cleansed and redeemed and exalted? Well, I think we get the answer at the end of this, which is because of the branch of the Lord that is glorious and exalted. The branch of the Lord is only introduced in chapter 4. It's going to be later fully explained in chapter 11 as the coming king who's promised. Isaiah does that a lot. He introduces something, and then chapters later, he explains it in more depth. So within the structure of this introduction, This passage is so different, it's so positive, it's so hopeful because God is giving his people a stirring vision for a glorious future hope, assuring them that the Lord will eventually lead his people to fulfill his vision for them. In the middle of these strong threats of judgment, he wants his people to hear and remember the greater plan for their eventual redemption and glorious hope for the future. One of my favorite short passages from Return of the King. Actually quoted in the latest episode of uh, Rings of Power. And in, in Tolkien's original. Sam is the one who sees it. He's in Mordor. He's surrounded by darkness. He's surrounded by death. He's surrounded by evil. And it seems hopeless. He thinks Frodo has just been killed. He takes the ring. He's determined that he's going to finish the mission, but it seems an overwhelming task. He looks up in the sky and been overcrowded with clouds all the time, but just then the clouds break and he sees a couple of stars. And he says, he realized in that moment that all this darkness is but a small and passing thing. And that beyond that is a light that shines eternally that all of this darkness cannot touch. And God wants his people to know that. God wants his people to know, yes, you're sinful. Yes, you're rebellious. Yes, you're going to be disciplined. Yes, it's going to be hard. But I have a future planned for you. There is a hope that is coming. And this brings us to the theological reasons. God's holiness and justice demand that sin be punished 
And our sins are so heinous that we deserve both discipline in this life and eternal condemnation. But God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7. You see, God's greater plan for your life and my life is not our condemnation, but our glorious salvation. Not our eternal destruction, but our eternal glorification. And our glorification only comes through the exaltation of the branch of the Lord. If you belong to God through faith in Jesus Christ, do you know that the big, light, the big story of your life is not how sinful you are, but how gracious God is? Do you know that? We're accustomed to saying as good Christians, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Okay, maybe we should say that a little bit differently. Yes, I am a sinner, but I am saved by grace. Because grace is the bigger story. The big picture framework of your life is not how you suffer consequences for your foolish choices, although we all do but it is rather how the Lord chose you from all eternity and will glorify you for all eternity. And did you know the big story of the church of Jesus Christ, God's holy and beloved people, is not that we're just a bunch of compromised, worldly, foolish, often hypocritical people. We are. <laughs> Far too much. But that's not the big story. The big story is how God has forgiven all of our sins in Jesus Christ and is using us to bring others to himself and he will glorify himself in us forever. And the only reason why that is the big story is because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, who is the righteous branch of the Lord and who is our salvation. Now, for us to fully and rightly see that this passage is telling us that truth, we have to understand that this passage is actually about us in the church and not ultimately about a physical mountain and a long ago destroyed building in Israel. So let's unpack that together. Verse 2 says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. The mountain of the house of the Lord, or we could say the mountain of the temple of Yahweh. It's Mount Zion. It's where Jerusalem stands. This mountain was the scene of two very powerful pictures of gospel reality given to us in the Old Testament. The first is a picture of required sacrifice. And that comes in Genesis 22 when Abraham is called by God to do the impossible, to take his son, his only son, whom he loved, Isaac, and to sacrifice him on this mountain. And Abraham obeys, and Abraham goes. And as they're walking up the mountain, Isaac is carrying the wood on his back, and he asks his father, he says, Father, here is the wood and here is the fire, but where is the lamb for the offering? And Abraham, the prophet, says... God himself will provide the lamb for the offering. He lays Isaac on the, on the altar. He draws back his knife, and the Lord says, Stop. Do not harm the child. And the Lord provides in that moment not a lamb, but a ram caught in the thicket to take the place of Isaac. But then the Lord says to Abraham, On the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided, or he shall be provided, either way. And that's when Abraham says, Yahweh Yirah, or Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, the provider. On that place, God says, yes, you need a sacrifice, and I will provide it. Years later, about a thousand years later, Abraham's distant descendant, David, 
the king. He's king over Israel, and there's a judgment that comes against Israel because of David's sin, and there's a plague that's sweeping through the land. And God stops the plague at this mountain. And David goes, and he buys, it is at that time, the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. And David buys that threshing floor, and he offers up a sacrifice. He makes intercession for the people. And then he buys the land, and his son Solomon builds the temple there. So it's a place of provided sacrifice, a promise of provided sacrifice, and it's a place of intercession for God's people. And then it becomes the place of the gathering of the worship of God's people when it becomes the home of the temple. But when Jesus came into the world, he went to that temple, and twice he cleansed it. Because one thing that was very, very consistent at that temple is that God's people kept polluting it with their faithlessness. At times they would be so bold as to bring idols into the temple and to worship false gods right there in the midst of the temple. But when Jesus got there, they thought they had fixed it all. There were no more idols. They thought they were doing it right and making a lot of money out of it in the process. There were money changers and there were animal sellers and Jesus twice He turns over the table, he drives out the money changers and the animal sellers, and he says, my father said my house will be a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The same exact accusations that we hear leveled against God's people in Isaiah, Jesus levels against them again. You have thieves, you have robbers in the very temple of God. And then Jesus says, the first time he cleanses the temple, Jesus says, Something very interesting. In John chapter 2, the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build the temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead... His disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When that great you catastrophe came, that great sudden reversal, they said, oh yeah, Jesus talked about this. He said, if you destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it again. Jesus said his body was the temple. He also prophesied that that second temple in Jerusalem, known widely as Herod's temple, would be completely cast down and destroyed. Matthew 24 Jesus left the temple and was going away. His disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. He answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will be not left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And in the year A.D. 70, that temple was torn down and it has never been rebuilt because God is not interested in rebuilding that temple because he's already in the process of building a new and better temple. In the Gospel of Matthew, Peter makes his great confession of faith. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds to that confession of faith by saying, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So Jesus said during his earthly life, my body is the temple. And he said, on Peter's confession of faith, I will build my church. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're told that we in the church who belong to God through faith in Jesus Christ are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Paul says you and I are members of the household of God. And what he means by that is this picture, you're a stone in the living temple. Peter makes that even more explicit 
in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says that we are living stones who are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And of course, you probably know the church is also called the body of Christ in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and in Ephesians 4. So the church is the body of Christ and is the living temple of God. Christ is the head of the body and the chief cornerstone of the temple. We are that body and we are that temple. Not only that, but there's language in Galatians 4 and in Hebrews 12 that tells us that we in the church are the fulfillment of Mount Zion. We are standing on Mount Zion as the temple of the Lord in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the church is the fulfillment of the true Jerusalem, the Jerusalem above that is free. That's what Galatians 4 says. Also the true fulfillment of Mount Zion, the place where God meets redemptively with his people and the, and the fulfillment of the temple of God. Why does all this matter? Why does it matter that we are the true Jerusalem and the holy temple? It matters in part because it means that the Old Testament is indeed our story. That the people of God are indeed our people. That the promises of God that are given here in Isaiah 2 are our promises. There's a school of thought that has been teaching for years that this is referencing the rebuilding of an earthly temple on an earthly mountain in Jerusalem, and that only when that happens will this come true. And we miss the clear biblical teaching that we are the temple that God is building. There's no point in going back to an earthly Jerusalem, to an earthly temple. So what? Animals can be sacrificed again? That age is past. That was an age of preparation. We are in the age of fulfillment. Those were limited earthly physical things that were pictures. We are now the fulfillment of those pictures. When Jesus said, listen to this, when Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What are gates? They're defensive. They're used to keep out an intruder. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church and it's going to spread to the nations. When he left, he told his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Go and make disciples. And Jesus says, as the church advances to the ends of the earth, the gates of hell that have kept people locked in strongholds of ignorance and unbelief, the gates of hell cannot stand against the advance of the gospel light through the church. And so people would ask, well, when is this going to happen? Well, verse 2 tells us it happens in the latter days. So what time does the Lord have in mind for this prophecy? And a very common answer to this question is, well, this is going to happen in the last days in the days of the millennial kingdom, or maybe you know when Antichrist comes. And I would say, yes, that is correct. But I would also say, <clears throat> I do not think those words mean what you think they mean. <laughs> and they might say, inconceivable. <laughs> but we, if you read the New Testament, we are living in the last days. And there's already Antichrist at work in the world, and Christ is already reigning over his kingdom. Someone ever asks me, do you think we're living in the last days? I say, I know we're living in the last days. Because if you just read what the New Testament says about the terms last days and last hour, it's very clear. First place we see this is in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit's just been poured out on the day of Pentecost. All people are speaking in tongues and they're, and they're prophesying. And Peter gets up to preach the first sermon of the New Covenant era. 
And he says, to explain what is happening, he says, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Peter is saying that the prophet Joel, the last day's prophecy about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit is fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And so the day of Pentecost was in the last days. Hebrews chapter 1 opens by saying, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So the author of Hebrews identifies the days they were living in in the first century in which God has spoken to us by his Son as these last days. And today, guess what? The Spirit is still being poured out on all believers. And God is still speaking to us in his son, so we're still living in the last days. In fact, we're not only living in the last days, but we're living in the last hour. Here's what John says in 1 John chapter 2, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be plain that they are not all of us. John is talking in very plain, very clear language. This is the last hour. Many antichrists have come. Who are they? They're people who go out from the church and who badmouth the name of Jesus Christ. They're people who abandon the faith and then who work against the Christian faith in the world and I named some of them last week because I'm not afraid to name names, but um, those are antichrists. They're anti-Christ. Not, we're not looking for some supernatural spawn of Satan thing that you might have seen in a Hollywood movie. That's not what antichrist is, not as it's used in Scripture. So, the latter days began at Pentecost, and they will end when Jesus returns. And I believe this is also the age of the millennial kingdom, which is spiritual in nature and is spreading throughout the whole earth. I believe we have many antichrists who still plague the church and who seek to undermine the cause of the gospel throughout the church age until Jesus comes again. And I honestly think that the reason why so many people are confused about these things is they don't consult the whole counsel of God's word, both old and new. The, the New Testament is in the old, concealed, and the Old Testament is by the new revealed. The new is in the old concealed, and the old is by the new revealed. They go together. So if you're reading about an idea in the Old Testament, you shouldn't read it as if the New Testament hadn't been written. You should say, well, what does the New Testament say about this idea? And if you're reading about something in the, old, in the New Testament, you're like, what is that talking about? You can go back and get your foundation from the Old Testament. God gave us the whole Bible so that we would read the whole Bible. It's all God's word for us. So we look at this passage and we see that actually this is being fulfilled in the church today. The church of Jesus Christ is spreading to every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Queen Elizabeth was the monarch of England, but she was so crowned by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and when the Archbishop of Canterbury crowns the monarch of Great Britain, I don't know if King Charles is going to take it any seriously, but when the monarch of Great Britain is crowned, the Archbishop says, I give you this crown until the coming of the Lord Jesus, to whom it rightly belongs. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And yet we don't see all of this passage being fulfilled, do we? We certainly don't see the nations beating their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. We don't see the case that nation will not lift up sword against nation anymore. People of Ukraine know that painfully well. In fact, we have 
such darkness in the world that even a professing Christian leader of the church, like the leader of the Orthodox Church in Russia, can say, Russian men, if you go and fight in Ukraine, you are fighting in a godly cause, and you will be blessed by the Lord. So we don't see all this happening, but we do see it happening, but not all the way. And this is true of all of these kinds of promises. And so what we have said is that we live in an age of fulfillment, but not consummation. Or we live in an age where the, the kingdom of God has already come, but it is not yet fully revealed. We live in the already, but the not yet. Christ is enthroned as King of kings and Lord of lords. He sits at the right hand of God the Father on high, and he will reign forever and ever. Amen? But the world doesn't know that. The world laughs at Christians for believing that. But one day he will come again, and he will be revealed from east to west, and every eye will see him, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. That day is not yet. That day is coming. And when that day comes we will see this passage not just fulfilled, but actually fully consummated. Fully consummated. This gives us what I would characterize as a grounded and realistic hope. A strong and certain hope, but also realistic expectations for this age before Jesus comes again. What do I mean by that? We have the promise of God that the gospel will continue to advance in this world. We, that's why we do missions. We're, we're training men and sending them into Sudan because we believe that the gospel will bear fruit in Sudan. But we don't believe that there will be the glory of the kingdom until Jesus comes again. And so we keep our expectations realistic and we know that right alongside gospel advance, the church will continue to face opposition, even violent opposition. But just as surely as the cross must come before the crown, we can be assured that the crown is coming and that our age of taking up our cross daily and following Jesus will come up to an end. But as long as we're in this life, we're still called to take up our cross daily and follow Jesus. We're still told everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So the kingdom comes, but it comes with persecution until Jesus comes again. So what we have in this passage is a, a call to the church. This is what Christ is doing, and this is what Christ will do in and through his church. And so what do we do in the meantime? What do we do while we wait in hope? Well, the final verse has a very simple and gracious invitation to us. O house of Jacob, that's you and me, that's the church. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This world is full of darkness. The light of the Lord is the Lord's goodness, truth, and righteousness. And if we are confident in our glorious hope, it means we don't need to chase after the world's empty promises or cower in fear of the world's threats. Instead, the call is very simple and very plain and very encouraging. Come, come. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. So we don't put our hope in political strategies or culture wars. We put our hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the church of Jesus Christ, in the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, in our witness to the nations, and in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he will come again in victory. And we are to walk in in the light of the Lord. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, who are we? <laughs> I mean, really, who are we, Lord, that you would include us in this kingdom, that you would call us to be living stones in a holy temple that is being built up to glorify you? We're 
as rebellious as anyone else, as stubborn and sinful as anyone else, but we are sinners who are saved by grace. And your grace is stronger than our sin. And the blood of Jesus is more powerful than our rebelliousness. And the Spirit of God is more powerful than our stubbornness. And the plans and purposes of God are more sure and lasting than our foolishness. So, Father, let us walk in the light of the Lord until that day when Jesus comes again. We thank you that all of your promises are yes in Christ. We thank you that in him, our our chief cornerstone and our head, we can be your body and your temple. Build us up even as we prepare to share in his table together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.